talk to a couple of you. Uh, if you are visiting with us, of course, as it says, we fill out a visitor's card. You can just leave that at the end of the queue or place that in the collection at the proper time. Uh, we encourage you, if you have any questions, if you uh, have anything you would like to know more about, get with us. We'd be happy to explain uh, the things that we do here and the, why we do or don't do certain things, and we will do our best to give you a Bible answer for those. Well, last week, we had Brother Todd Williams here at my family hour on vacation. Uh, appreciate so much, Brother Todd, filling in for me. I've known Brother Todd about eight years. Uh, we were preaching school together. Uh, and of course, his father preaches at the 201 congregation here, so uh, we're glad to have him be able to be over here and to uh, give the morning and evening lesson. I was fortunate to get back in time that I heard his evening lesson and we were able to be here. Well, we're going to pick up this week. What we've been doing is looking at the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And in these life and teachings, and he is teaching us valuable lessons about the kingdom, the characteristics of those in the kingdom, and the benefits of those in the kingdom, not only to those who are members of the kingdom, but to those in the world. And that's kind of what we get to here with the similitude. Uh, which is the title of today's lesson, and it's just a way of describing that section of uh, scripture that we read with Bob. And in that scripture, this is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it contains again these similitudes. They're, they're uh, a meaning that has a, a likeness. There's a resemblance. Uh, it's a similitude of patterns, and that a person or a thing is like or the match or the counterpart of another. And so he, he's putting these together as an expression to show these similes between things as a comparison. Now, one of the things noted about the Messiah when we looked at his teachings is he often talked this way. He would talk in parables. He would talk in these similitudes. He would use comparisons of things in life that people were you know, familiar with. And, and that was a way, again, as we're looking at the book of Matthew, Matthew relates many times how Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. And so this is another one of those ones. In Matthew 13, and starting in verse uh, 34, I'm uh, sorry, 24, uh, Matthew writes, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to them. And those what Matthew says. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. And so Matthew relates this. That why did Jesus speak in parables? It's fulfillment of prophecy. And then we see also in Psalm 78, verse 2. It says, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark sayings of old. And this is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. It's used in parables. And this is a principal part of his teachings. And Matthew records this. And the first four parables are given and as Jesus addresses the multitudes and the things in them, the mysteries. They're what are being spoken of. Jesus is revealing these things that are coming that were spoken of by the prophets to this coming kingdom, this coming Messiah. We think of some of Jesus' you know, talking when he was in the temple and he stood up and he read. And after he read from the scroll, he sat down and these things are fulfilled today in your sight, he says. As we get in more into the uh, Sermon on the Mount here, we'll, we'll start to hear his teachings as we go through and saying, you have heard it said, but I said. And so he is showing these things that were hidden, these mysteries that God had yet to reveal were now being revealed. And Jesus spoke these words early on in his ministry. And it was the second year. He had just a few followers. And they were not spoken to the religious leaders. Know who Jesus is proud of. He is talking to people who are, are farmers, they're fishermen, they're merchants. Not to say that he excluded the religious leaders. Remember, not too long ago, we looked at Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, and come to him by night. And so he doesn't limit this. The centurion. He talks to Roman officials. He didn't limit it. But notice that his message is one that ordinary people could understand. His purpose was to save people, the saved man. And his words appear to some, uh, to some to be presumptuous or even absurd. Think about when he stands before Pilate, what is true. And so not everybody understood what he was saying. 
Right? He has a conversation with disciples about that later. That'll be number 11. But Christ's purpose was to save people. His words may have, may have appeared presumptuous to some, but he is absurd that they weren't. If you stop and you listen to what he's saying, he often talked referring uh, to things that his audience would understand. Things that they were, were familiar with. They recognized. One time he compared himself to a door. We know what a door does. We know how a door operates. It allows you entry into something. He spoke of himself as a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Care for the flock. They feed it. They protect it. And now here he, he starts to compare his followers to something that they're familiar with. Light and salt. Light and salt are essential to life. We're going to see today. And we see he isn't telling them that they are salt and light of Palestine. They're, they're not the salt and light of Judea. They're, they're not the salt and light to just the Gentiles. They're not the salt and light to just the Jews. They're to be the salt and the light to the whole world. He's talking to his disciples. Many of those would become Christians. So if the Beatitudes, and I know that we had taught Brother Todd here, so it's been a little while, but two weeks back, we talked about the Beatitudes. If the Beatitudes teach the relationship of disciples to the kingdom, about what relationship do these similitudes teach? And we see that the Beatitudes established that following Jesus would bring blessings to his followers. But here he declares that being his followers would bless others. As the Beatitudes outline the character desired by the disciples, here Jesus now tells the effect of that character upon others. Now, some have described this as the greatest chapter of the power of Christian influence. The comparison of salt and light is our relationship as Christians to the world. Our influence as being members of the kingdom upon the entire world. You know, sometimes we, we get hung up, we get stuck in this thought that, you know, well, we're a member of the Midway congregation. And, and you know, I have this circle of friends that, you know, come out me each week. But we have an influence outside of this building. We have an influence as the church upon all those that we come in contact with. In Proverbs 27, in verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the confidence of his friend. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? As Christians, we are called to a service, to a duty, we are called to the service of God to be useful. When we accept Christ and we humble ourselves, putting on Christ in baptism, he sanctifies us. He sets us aside for his use. Just as in the Old Testament, God set aside those who were his for his purpose. We are to be useful. And that goes toward our character. In our character of those who are members of the kingdom, we think of 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. It says, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. We should be of such a moral character that when people speak evil of us, those who know us, we got the wrong person. You're mistaking them with somebody else. Well, our usefulness, though, can be lost. We can lose that usefulness. We think about how do we lose our usefulness? It could be due to the world. David lusted. Judas had greed. We can give in to the lust of the flesh. We can sin. And if we sin and we don't repent, then we've lost our usefulness. You know, I've often said, you know, as a Christian, our neighbors know that we're Christians. Our neighbors know each Sunday morning if your car is not in the driveway. 
But then imagine you're out in the yard and you, you bang your knuckle trying to start the mower and some words escape your mouth. You have lost your usefulness. What about failing to meet our obligations? The Israelites did that numerous times, did they not? In fact, we just started here uh, two nights ago reading the book of Judges in our nightly reading and we're reading the kids. And of course, the whole book of Judges deals with them using uh, or, or them failing to meet their obligations time and time again. Solomon, he married women he shouldn't have. It caused him to lose his obligation to God because all these idolatrous uh, things that came about because of it. What if we don't do as we should? James tells us in James 4 and verse 17, to those who know to do, do good and do not, to them it is sin. When we know what we're supposed to do and we don't do it, it's sin. What about lack of glory to God? Saul thought too highly of himself, didn't he? Remember, he offered sacrifice because the you know, prophets, he runs late. People are starting to leave. The priests, they offered sacrifices in near lip service. People draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The Pharisees drew attention to themselves, not to God. Love to stand on the corners. Love to have the praise of men. Love to have the best seats. What about us? If we don't humble ourselves before God, if we don't put God first in our lives, we can lose our usefulness if we're not giving glory to God. And so when we talk about the salt of the earth, what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? Now, when Jesus spoke to his listeners, they understood Maybe in today's society, maybe we've lost the meaning of what it is to be the salt of the earth. Long ago, people regarded salt deposits as a gift from God. Battles were even fought over salt deposits. Can you imagine that? You go into war because we found a pit of salt. The Jews used salt in their offerings and in their sacrifices. Look at Leviticus, Ezekiel, even into Mark he speaks of it. People were even paid in salt. Can you believe that? Have you ever heard the term, he's worth his salt? Where do you think that came from? Roman soldiers used to get paid in salt because salt had a usefulness to it. You ever hear the word salary? It comes from the Greek word sal sal salarius, salt. Salt's essential for life. There's chloride, sodium ions in salt. These are two major components of salt, and they're needed in, guess what? All living creatures. Salt is involved in regulating the water content, our fluid balance, and our bodies. Jesus knew this. He understood it, when, and, his, and his listeners understood it when he said, you are the salt. It's interesting to think that Christians, by our influence, we're keeping a balance in the world against evil. Have you ever thought of that? James 4, verse 17, that him who knows to do good and does not. By our influence, we're keeping a, battle, uh, keeping a balance in the world against evil. And since a major use of salt is a preservation of meat, the metaphor that Jesus uses means that the Lord's disciples sustain a similar relationship to human society. Where we're keeping it from decay. You remember back in the Old Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah? What was it that Lot or uh, Abraham had asked there? How many precious people have God spared for him? Just ten? If you have ten righteous people, ten people that are the salt of the earth, God said, I spare that city. Salt preserves, it purifies. Elijah used it to purify the poisoned waters of Jericho in 2 Kings 2. People Dating back centuries, understood that salt preserved from putrefaction, from decay. The Egyptians used salt to preserve birds and fishes in their tombs. We also use fish, don't we? Or use salt? You ever think do anything packed meat or salt or fish and salt? Maybe not so much if you live in the city. 
But guess what? The Phoenicians did it. Phoenicians would travel a long ways. They'd have these fish and things and birds that you'd have to salt because it would preserve them until they got to their next destination. They could trade them. They could sell them. It has medicinal value also. It can soothe. It can heal. Uh, people take salt tablets when they feel fatigued. When I was in the military, salt tablets were a standard thing in our pack. People go hiking, carry salt tablets with them. It helps with moisture. Salt also brings out flavor in food. In Job 6, in verse 6, it reads, Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Remember a lesson I gave a while back? It was on a Sunday evening about the, the king and his daughters who brought him gifts. And one daughter, the youngest, brought him salt. He was all insulted. She would bring him salt. And so the, the, the cook, he left salt on every meal. Until the king finally called the cook. He said, what is going on with the food? Well, I heard you didn't like salt, so I've left it out on the food. I don't know the food. And it went then when the king realized the value of salt. Jesus was telling his disciples they were to be the preserving, healing, enhancing influence on all those around them. To the world. This salt brought out the hidden qualities of food, so does it to those who Christian would have in their lives. We can influence others for good by our influence. If salt preserves meat, Christians are to preserve the world by their godly living. But salt has to come in contact with the things that it's going to work on. We talked about in the Bible class this morning, Paul, and how in Acts chapter 21 that he goes to certain things he did in order to, to be able to have an avenue of, of evangelism. And in Corinthians, he talked about how he became all things to all men that he might believe some. And yet he didn't allow himself to sin. The things that he was able to do that would gain him access to be able to preach the gospel, that didn't violate the law of Christ, those things he could do, that he could win some. Oftentimes, you know, we have to kind of you know, temper when we're teaching somebody. They're not ready for certain things in time. And so sometimes we can make allowance, as long as it doesn't cause us to sin, in order that we might be able to gain their confidence and we can share the gospel with them. And it's a good argument for to be in the world, but not of the world. Paul, he writes, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, and verse 2. Of course, Romans 12 and verse 1, he talks about how we're to be a living sacrifice. But salt can lose its savor. You know that? Salt can lose its preserving power. If it's mixed with foreign substances, if it's contaminated, what about us? If we contaminate ourselves with the ways of the world, salt that's lost its savor, it's good for nothing. Jesus says that salt that's lost its flavor, it is neither fit for the land or for the dunghill, but to be thrown out. Luke chapter 14, verse 35. It can destroy all fertility where it is thrown when it has lost its savor. People sometimes use it in the cracks of sidewalks to keep grass from growing up there. People, God is warning us. Because he doesn't want anyone anywhere to lose their savor as a Christian. And because those who understood that when it lost its savor, it was no longer good, they would toss it out. They'd dispose it. In eastern countries, when salt became impure, it lost its saltiness, leaving it worthless. It was cast out on pathways to be walked upon. It lost its savor. The only thing it was good for was lining up a walkway to keep the weeds from growing up. Trod on your feet. But if the salt loses its flavor, well, what then? What about for us as Christians? Was Jesus saying that if we lose our righteous influence, our saltiness, that we're no longer good for anything? That we're to be thrown out and trampled upon? Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? People knew 
if you ran out of salt, if you lost its savor, you went back and you got some more from the source. If we lose our saltiness, we can be resalted. We can regain our savor. How do we do that? Well, the only sin we cannot be forgiven of is the sin that we will not repent of. Jesus knew when he asked, how shall it be seasoned? The psalmist once said, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. If we would draw back to the source where we first gained our saltiness, where we first got those purifying words of the Lord, and where we first heard the gospel, from the word of God itself, if we would draw back to Christ, God says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. I, I always love that verse because if we would draw back to God, he says if we're walking in the light, if we get out of the light, we need to get back in the light. We need to get back to God. He says if we would do that, if we would come to him, if we would confess our sins to God, it doesn't say that he would forgive us of something, or cleanse you a little bit. He says, I will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God that he talked about our sins and how he'll remember them no more. He doesn't hold them against us when we come to him with humble repentance. We return to him. We return back to him when we are re-seasoned, we're re-salted. And then we're that proper influence that we should be again. And so then he goes on to talk about the light of the world. Light, like salt, is necessary to life. Light causes plants to grow. It's necessary. Because when we think about all the animals that eat plants, and then we eat animals. Animals eat animals. We need light. In addition, the light causing plants to grow. They, they, they give off oxygen that we need to survive. <coughs> light also provides warmth. Without the sun, for instance, all life on Earth would die. It's an amazing thing. If we were just 10 degrees off in our rotation around the sun, we'd be burned up. 10 degrees the other way, we would freeze. We have the perfect balance. We need that light. Salt and light are both essential to life. And once again, Jesus uses something that his hearers were familiar with. Do you think a farmer knows about light? Do you think as he grows his crop, he understands that he needs the sun? What about a fisherman? Uh, as a kid, my dad, he always wanted to get up with the crack of dawn. He'd get, he'd, we'd wake up before the sun was up. Because we had to be out of the lake at a certain time because the fish were there at a certain time. If we waited too long, when the sun came up, the fish drove down deeper. It became harder to fish. I used to tell my dad, man, if the fishers, you know, the fishers sleeping or awake, uh, they want, they'll be awake later if they're awake now. No, no, we have to be out there now because this is the best time for fishing. Fishermen understood that. They're familiar with it. They understood the necessity of life. So if you're a fisherman and you go out and all the fish are gone because it's the wrong time of day and you don't have any catch, you don't have any livelihood. They understood that relationship. Once again, Jesus used something they were familiar with. What about the time when he said, I am the bread of life? We understand the necessity of food that we need to eat. John 6, verse 28. Or what about in John 4, when the disciples came to him and they wanted, do you have food to eat that we don't know about? He said, my food is to do the will of the Father's Son. And what about that whole conversation with the Samaritan woman, when he talked about water, and those who would drink of his fountain would never thirst again? See how he used things they understood? What about in John 8, verse 12? Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have light, have the light of life. Light and light. They go together. What about in John 9, verse 5? He says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is telling us 
that we are not only to participate in God's plan and in his purpose to some extent, but that we are to share the characteristics of God and Jesus in whose image we are created. You know what Genesis 1 verse 26 says? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. He's not speaking of our physical appearance. His brother Gordon and I also can't think of it. If we're made in the physical image of God, well, why does Brother Bob look different than Brother John? He's talking about our inner character. He's not talking about our physical appearance. He's talking about our spiritual being. He's talking about our moral ethic, our characteristic, our inner man. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, John said, God is light. In John 8 and verse 12, Jesus is the light. And then Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5, he says, you are all sons, speaking to Christians, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. <clears throat> As Christians, we are to be the light. Jesus' imagery tells us something about the world. It is in darkness. How often have you heard those who claim that abortion, that homosexuality, that, ho that social drinking, I'm getting those in now because it may be illegal in the next year. Transgender, whatever, that they're okay. Christians, you're just not enlightened. Christians, you, you're just, you're making it. You're narrow minded. Isn't that what we hear? You're just not in tune with today's society. Things have changed. That's what the world would like us to believe. They claim to be enlightened and that we are not. Because we won't accept evil. Isn't that what Isaiah says from Isaiah 5 and verse 20? Woe to you those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. John says in him, speaking of Jesus, was light, and the light was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John 1, verses 4 and 5. The world is covered in darkness and in sin. And those not illuminated by God's word are in darkness. And they don't see it. The world actually prefers darkness. It would seem, doesn't it? To read the news. Just turn on the TV. Turn on your social media. Make a comment on one of the social media sites of something righteous and moral. And see how you can get back. How do you stir up trouble on social media? Just speak of biblical truth. John 3 and verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Nobody likes to be told that what they're doing is evil. Nobody likes to be told that they're in sin. Nobody likes to be told that they're doing wrong. But notice in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, speaking the truth in love, truth comes first. We tend to the truth with love. But the truth has to come first. We have to stand for God's word. And the world may be in darkness, but Christians are to be the light of the world that dispels the darkness. As followers of Jesus, we're to let our light shine. We're to be leading the right kind of life. We're to be making sure that we are doing things that are leading to eternal life. One of my favorite songs is This World Is Not My Home. I love that too. I'm reminded of it every day. This world is not my home. But I have a citizenship in heaven. And I look forward to that day when I will be there. Paul challenged his readers. He says in Philippians 2, verse 15, Become blameless and harmless, children of God, <clears throat> without fault. We're to be blameless. That doesn't mean we're perfect. We make mistakes. But see, if we're walking in the light and we confess our sins to He's right, He will forgive us. So we're to live the right kind of life. Harmless. The time on the Wednesday in Bible class, how that in the kingdom there will be no weapons. It's not a carnal warfare. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 6. You know, we don't 
fight against flesh and blood, play against principalities, against the forces of darkness. And so we're to be harmless, where we don't come threatening with danger. He says, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as light.
When you put that bushel over that light, it's gone. Not to mention it's going to remove the oxygen after a amount of time and it's going to extinguish. What about us as Christians? You need to think about the future. Why would you light a lamp and put it on a lampstand and cover it up? Remember, we didn't have electric lights. We were in a room, no windows maybe. Single door, we shut that door because it's night and we're in bed. Now we, we want to light the light so we can see, but now we're going to cover it up. It makes no sense at all. But what about us? Would we light our light and then hide it? What would be the sense? And if we cover our light, how long before that light extinguishes? I was just talking to somebody the other day. I remember. We were talking to my mom's Puerto Rican and Italian. My dad's part Mexican. And from that house, nobody spoke Italian or Mexican or whatever. I learned Spanish on my own, but then haven't used it in years, and I forgot. Guess what happens? We don't use our light. We don't forget. Like that light under a bushel is going to be extinguished. You know, in ancient times, if you didn't have fire, you know how you got fire? Did you kindle that fire yourself? Did you go to some place where there's fire? Go to your neighbor. Go to the source. If we lose our light, then those who are spiritual, if you see one in a trust hand, you're to restore one such a one, Galatians 6 and verse 1. And if we know that our light's going out, we need to draw back to the source, to the light, to Jesus. Well, consider this morning the contrast between salt and light. So the primary purpose of salt in those days was largely negative, to prevent decay. We don't want things to decay. The primary purpose of light is positive, to dispel darkness. As Christians, the two figures Jesus spoke of tells us that we as Christians, we are to prevent the decay of society by dispelling the darkness that is within us. Consider also that Jesus was the salt and the light. He tells us to be. And Jesus, like salt, he brought out the qualities of those he touched, and he preserved them from decay. <coughs> Think about each time Jesus was with somebody. Did he put them down? Did he insult them? Did he condemn them for the sins they were in? He certainly called them out of sin, though, didn't he? I think he was telling one person after he healed them, go and sin no more. In fact, I remember another occasion he told them, one, a lady, go and sin no more. He had them. You see, the truth spoken in love. We don't seek to destroy others. We seek to preserve them. Preserve the light. We share the truth with them. Just like Jesus did. Each time that he was presented with somebody who was in a sin, he showed them the light. The world has no greater need for Christians than the characters they demonstrate. There's nothing in this world more important than God and His servant Him. Isn't that the conclusion of Ecclesiastes? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. Salt and light are essential for life. There's only a few things in life that are essential. Remember, I gave a lesson a couple months ago about survival things and things we need for survival. We talk about food, we talk about the shelter, we talk about air. People often complain about the evils in the world, about the sin. But the Christian is to be without grumble or complaint. Just because we're in the world doesn't mean we're to be of the world. We're to be the salt of the light. And when we think about evil, evil is not the opposite of good. Evil is the absence of good. If we would be the good in the world, let our light shine, being salt, we could make evil decrease. This morning, if you are not being salt and the light to those around you, you might not be. Examine yourselves. You know whether you're in the faith. You know when you're doing the things you should do or you're doing the things you should not do. And if you are doing the things you should do, then keep on keeping on. Your efforts are not and if you're not doing the things you should be doing, you might be the changes. And if you're not of the light, if you 
are not a New Testament Christian. That is somebody who has heard the gospel and it has caused in them belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it has moved them to repentance, to change their lives and draw closer to Jesus, to follow his commands and do his things. And he calls us then to make confession before others that we believe Jesus is the Christ. And to humble ourselves to be baptized, buried in water. And that's where we're united with Christ. We're united with one another. He washes away our sins. And the Lord adds us to his church. We have anyone this morning. If it is further guidance in the scriptures, if you're in need of prayers for a difficulty of life, or if you're ready to take that step and be baptized with Christ, we invite you to come forward and go.